An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 7, June 12, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last session we began to address the objection which has been raised against Hegelian philosophy from fairly early on, and which is indeed a radical one. It is this. Why does this philosophy merely seem to acknowledge contradiction rather than simple difference? In this objection, it is not difficult to recognize a rather more precise formulation of the problem, which I have already mentioned in more general terms, namely the problem of whether Hegelian philosophy ultimately forces everything that exists into a conceptual straitjacket. Now you might say, and it would not be the first time it has been said, that this is a bit like the case of the emperor's beard, as we say, that is, making a big issue out of nothing. Perhaps the dialectic in the strict form it assumed in Hegel was just a kind of device which helped this philosophy to engage with history, but one which we could not relinquish without losing very much in the process. And under the influence of positivism in particular, there are innumerable cases where this has actually been undertaken by those who imagine that they can salvage or preserve something from Hegel in this way. Thus, according to one well-known formulation, we might say that Hegel, the absolute idealist, is also an equally great realist, that in reality all of the knowledge he has to offer, as Nikolai Hartmann puts it, comes from experience, a concept which is indeed particularly important in Hegel, and that what we find here is not so much a speculative or constructive dialectic as, to use a rather suspect expression, a real dialectic. If that were the case, we could simply spare ourselves the effort we are making here, and certainly spare ourselves the effort of engaging more closely with the two great systematic works of Hegelian philosophy, the phenomenology of spirit and the science of logic. We could then concentrate simply upon the so-called applied or material dimension of the Hegelian system, the most well-known and probably the most influential parts of which are the philosophy of history and the philosophy of right, and the most fruitful part of which is perhaps the aesthetics. <clears throat> but this approach cannot work for the simple reason that if we actually ignore the strictly constructive form of Hegelian philosophy, it ceases to be philosophy at all, and in fact becomes nothing but a rhapsodic collection of various more or less significant material insights. But the celebrated spiritual bond would then be just as missing here as in the standard practice of the positive sciences, which this philosophy specifically undertook to challenge. In other words, without the rigorous and fully elaborated dialectic, we would simply turn Hegel into a learned and many-sided historian of thought in the style of Wundt, or, in the best case, Dilthey. At the same time, perhaps even more importantly, we should thereby forfeit the very power which vouchsafed Hegel his insights in the first place. For with regard to Hegelian philosophy, we may safely say, for all that it is a science of the experience of consciousness, that this philosophy owes its capacity to grasp reality as it did, namely as something essentially developmental in character, solely to the dialectical principle, and that without this dialectical principle in its pointed form, everything that has remained of Hegel in the public consciousness The idea of development of dynamic process as the preeminent category in relation to all other concepts would also inevitably be lost or become a matter of merely contingent observation. Of course, the fact that this philosophy necessarily postulates some spiritual bond of this kind, if it is to be binding, is not sufficient to establish that the construction in question can actually be dignified as truly compelling. And, indeed, much of the critical discussion of the 19th century focused on this very aspect of Hegelian philosophy. Our task is to grasp this particular problematic very clearly, given that it concerns the core of the structure of this philosophy, rather than leaving the dimension of God or contradiction to itself, and turning instead to the wealth of concrete insights it contains,
insights which actually derive from that dimension anyway. For this core of the Hegelian philosophy, and this is the reason why I must encourage you to think through a whole series of, of far from simple reflections with me here, is indeed, the ref, uh, is indeed the principle of negation or the principle of contradiction. The attempt has been made to interpret the Hegelian philosophy above all and with particular emphasis by Kroner in his book From Kant to Hegel. In the last session, we tried to take the bull by the horns and derive the Hegelian concept of contradiction, or to put it directly, the Hegelian concept of dialectic from the Kantian dialectic. Thus, I would remind you that Kant's transcendental logic falls into two parts, namely the transcendental analytic and the transcendental dialectic, and that for Kant, the dialectic represents what would be called the negative side of transcendental logic. In straightforward terms, we can present the argument as follows. The critique of pure reason attempts to show the possibility of universally valid and necessary knowledge, or as Kant puts it, of synthetic a priori judgments. By analyzing consciousness and demonstrating that such universally valid and um, necessary knowledge is made possible only by virtue of the constitution constitutive forms of our consciousness itself. But the critique of pure reason, precisely by being a critique, already reveals two things. On the one hand, it wishes to exhibit the domain within which we are capable of such knowledge. While on the other, hold on, while on the other hand, it wishes to show where we are no longer capable of such valid and binding knowledge. Thus, reason wishes to exercise a critique of reason itself, precisely in order to prevent the latter from running riot, turning wild as it were, and presenting propositions as absolute, necessary, and universal, when in reality they are mere fabrications of the human mind. In other words, such a critique would not only serve to exhibit the necessity of metaphysics, it would emphatically reject metaphysics as well. If I present this basic systematic and methodological conception behind Kant's critique of pure reason to you and its full gravity, as I have just done here, some of you may already feel compelled to raise a question which, as tends to be the case with reasonable questions, you might actually drop once you have much greater familiarity with the matter at issue, and thus also much less distance towards it. This is something quite simple and is a reflection which may have occurred to you in a connection with those which led Hegel to his conception of dialectic in the first place. Thus you might say to yourselves, this is surely quite remarkable. Reason is supposed to criticize reason. Reason is supposed to assign to reason the limits within which it may now safely and confidently pursue its claim to universally valid and binding knowledge, and is supposed at the same time to cry. Halt if you venture beyond this point. You will be talking nonsense. You will be creating fabrications or at best producing assertions, which in reality cannot be presented as theoretical knowledge claims, but only as normative or regulative principles for human conduct. And you, might also, and you might also go on to say, but if as a rational being you assign these limits to reason here, is there not a sense in which you already raise yourself beyond these limits? And if reason claims to tell how far you may go and how far you may not go, does not this already imply that reason somehow stands beyond the limits which are set by reason itself? From where does reason derive the right? We, may also, we might also ask, and this is precisely how Hegel formulated the question, to subject knowledge to this critique, since for its part such a critique, a critique of the faculty of knowledge on the part of reason, is not itself an example of substantive knowledge or of material insight into any specific matters which are presented to us. On the contrary, it is nothing but a transcendental insight, as Kant calls it, that is, an insight which relates to mere possibility, but one which, according to Kant, is nonetheless supposed to possess absolute validity for the, con for the constitution of our knowledge in general. But if that is the case, then our knowledge must have within itself some kind of power which allows it to reach beyond the so-called possibility of experience. That is to say, it must be able to provide a, a kind of knowledge which does not itself depend upon given sensuous or material content, uh, 
which in other words does not depend in the last instance on mere sensation. If this really quite simple argument is correct, one which can be expressed by saying, as George Simmel formulated it, that to set limits also always means to step beyond them, then the distinction affirmed by the critique of pure reason between a positive part, namely the transcendental logic, which exhibits the fundamental concepts of our experience, and a negative part, namely the transcendental dialectic, where we find ourselves entangled in contradictions, then the separation is and the, then the separation in question is actually no longer legitimate. And then that second part, where we are necessarily entangled in contradictions, also belongs as a positive part as much to the domain of knowledge as the first part also does. For if our reason in reflecting upon cognit cognitive reason as such did not possess within itself the power to judge with regard to the unconditional and with regard to what is absolutely binding upon us, then it could not possibly pass those negative judgments which are indeed presented in the transcendental dialectic. In other words, reason must accordingly strive to take up precisely those contradictions, those antinomies, which are treated in the transcendental dialectic and incorporate themselves them within itself as a positive element, to take precisely those points where reason comes up against and advances beyond its own limits and transform into an organ of knowledge itself. In other words, the critical role of reason and the so-called positive role of reason must be fused with one another. That is, the positive knowledge of what is must take up that critical and negative moment within itself. And the merely negative, in turn, must not remain merely negative, but rather be developed to the, to the point where it becomes a positive moment within itself. That is, in fact, one of the most important aspects of the basic considerations which led Hegel to his radical formulation of the dialectic. In this regard, I could perhaps just read you a rather fine passage from Kroner, who sums up these thoughts as follows. In his critique of reason, Kant discovers the interdependence of the abstract and the concrete, of the formal and the material, of the rational and the empirical, of a, of a priori and a posteriori thought. <laughs> Inasmuch as the concrete, the material, the empirical, the a posteriori here effectively reflects upon itself, analyze, analyzes itself, criticizes itself. I might add here that the decisive concept for Hegel's considerations, which go beyond the Kantian position, is the concept of reflection. And I should also like to make a couple of remarks which may help to clarify the decisive dif difference between Hegel and his predecessors in this regard. We are talking here about the concept of reflection. Now, reflection in the first instance simply means a mirror image. In other words, reflection in Kant initially signifies the way that our reason contemplates reason itself. Um, relates as critical reason to the reason which stands before it. Now what Hegel essentially does, along with the other post-Kantian idealists, and this is what decisively distinguishes them all from Kant, is this. In <clears throat> Instead of performing this reflection in an unconscious manner, as the British empiricists did, instead of letting reason simply look at, it, look at itself in the mirror, as it were, they made this act of reflection itself, this faculty of reflection, into the very theme of philosophy. And the general claim that now emerges here is that this power which enables reason to know itself is and must be, at the same time, the power through which reason moves beyond itself in its finitude, and through which reason as something infinite finally comes to self-awareness. We could say that what we are talking about here is the reflection of reflection, as Schlegel once put it, about the consciousness which has become infinite within itself or infinitely reflected within itself and is the presupposition of this entire philosophy. If you would like a simple definition, if I may use this term here, or a simple explication of the central concept of Hegelian philosophy, which distinguishes this philosophy from that of Kant, namely the concept of speculation, and we may say that speculative consciousness in contrast to simple or simply reflective consciousness is one where this moment of self-reflecting consciousness has become thematic, 
has come to self-consciousness. Thus, here in the attempted analysis of knowledge itself, we already come upon what is ultimately the principal object of this dialectic itself, namely the distinction of subject and object which is already implicit in the peculiar internal doubling of reflection. From the one side here, you have thought as object, that which is being analyzed and examined, as Kant says, while on the other hand, you have thought as subject, the thinking which examines itself, or if you like, the transcendental principle itself, the principle of the synthesis of apperception, the synthetic principle itself. And these two sides are thus intrinsically bound up with one another. It is the entirely new and central role accorded to the concept of reflection which constitutes the organ of truth in this philosophy. And we shall see that this moment of reflection, and this is the answer to the question we have asked ourselves here, that this principle of self-knowing reflection is actually one with the principle of negation, the thinking of thinking. And here, as so often in Hegel, we find a renewal of an ancient Aristotelian motive. The gnosis, gnosos, the thinking of thinking itself in Hegel is actually nothing other than the fully developed principle of negativity. But allow me here to read a little more of the same passage from Kroner. Kant's critique of reason, he says, grounds the validity of the empirical on the synthesis of both moments, i.e. of the a priori and the a posteriori of the formal and the material in cognitive thought and in the knowing subject, the identity of which accomplishes the reciprocal supplementation of these two moments and renders it intelligible. In other words, it is the unity of consciousness, and the facts of this consciousness are precisely those which are brought together through synthesis in consciousness. It is this identity of personal consciousness that allows something like the unity of the world, the unity of the experience, that allows identity, and in the last analysis, also logical identity, to emerge for Kant in all, or at all. And Kroner then furnishes a clear and striking indication of that difference in relation to Kant, which we have been talking about. For the critique of reason itself, he writes, proceeds in a naive way in this regard, insofar as its reflection remains merely critical in character, and consequently, according to which way we consider it, remains either merely empirical or merely logical or analytic. To that extent, the togetherness of the moments, the synthesis, is merely deduced for empirical knowing, but its own knowing is contrasted with empirical knowing as mere reflection, as merely formal knowing, and thus not really as a knowing, but only as mere thinking, as a non-cognitive cognitive logic, i.e. a non-metaphysical logic. That is why this critique relates to metaphysics in a merely negative fashion can see in metaphysics nothing but a self-contradictory form of thinking, a thinking which is therefore devoid of content, self-destroying and nugatory in the same way as empirical thought sees the contradictions which rise in metaphysical thought. What this means can be expressed as follows. On the one side, in Kant, we have something like the form of knowledge or cognition, on the other side, we have the content. The content somehow happens to reach knowledge from outside. The content itself, we could almost say, is actually withdrawn from reflection. Kroner basically characterizes Hegel's position as follows. This whole separation actually has something rigid about it. On the one side, I presuppose that there are certain forms. And on the other side, I presuppose there are material contents. And I decree somewhat arbitrarily that these forms are only meant to be valid for those contents, but not valid in themselves. But in reflecting upon these forms, I already turn the forms themselves into content, as it were, and thereby show that this distinction of form and content from which I begin cannot possibly be conceived as an absolute distinction. And likewise, in turn, the supposed contents, i.e. the data of sensation, cannot possibly be given to me independently of my consciousness independently of the identity of thought. He says, in other words, that Kant had indeed already set forth the principle of synthesis, 
the principle of transcendental synthesis, or apperception, but he set it forth only in an abstract way, and thus did not actually get beyond the unmediated oppositions of form and content, of concrete and abstract, of a priori and a posteriori. And the task of philosophy is not simply to let these oppositions stand opposed to one another in a dogmatic manner, but rather to develop these oppositions in and out of one another. But Hegel nonetheless follows Kant insofar as he does not simply deny the tension which presents itself between these moments. The fact that form is not merely absorbed into content or that forms without content do indeed get themselves entangled in such difficulties. All those, in short, which Kant himself sets out in the transcendental dialectic. On the contrary, Hegel recognizes this tension, but he also says that I am not entitled to set up a kind of border or limit here, once I have acknowledged and taken up into my reflection the fact that I find myself in these difficulties when I attempt to move beyond the content with these forms. Then I can no longer suddenly call halt but must actually try instead to recognize these difficulties themselves as not simply the result of an external misapplication of my cognitive powers. Rather, I must try and grasp the very difficulties in which I find myself as an in in endogenous principle of cognition itself, since I cannot possibly evade them, since I cannot actually pass a single judgment, since I cannot express a single claim or proposition as a philosopher or theorist of knowledge without moving beyond the limit in question. For if I fail to step beyond this limit, that is, if I did not myself already possess some absolute cognition as one who expressly reflects upon reason itself, then I could never speak of this limit at all. The limit must be at once posited and transcended, and in this moment that the limit is that the limit is acknowledged in all seriousness as unavoidably posited, but as one that must nonetheless be transcended, you have the simple form of logical contradiction, which this thinking encounters once it no longer moves naively within the realm of either formal logical or merely empirical knowledge, but actually becomes a philosophy of reflection. In other words, once it moves in a realm where the empirical moment and the formal moment can be recognized as mediated with one another. This is an important point. This is an important point, for you can see here that Hegel does not simply cast formal logic overboard, as he has so often cheaply been accused of doing, and just philosophize away regardless, as if there were no such thing as the principle of contradiction. And to suggest that would be to get Hegel entirely wrong. In the first place, he acknowledges the validity of the principle of contradiction for the normal realm of knowledge established by the understanding, that is, both for our normal empirical knowledge and for the field of formal logic, just as for any other form of thought. But when I relate as a reflective subject, that is, when I do not just focus direct attention upon formal propositions or contents, but rather think through the relationship between these moments themselves, then I actually find that the form in which they can be grasped is solely and precisely the form of contradiction itself rather than the form of blank identity. What is denied, therefore, is not the contradiction of form and content or any contradiction of this kind, for such contradiction remains in force as far as our finite and limited knowledge is concerned, but precisely insofar as this knowledge attains self-consciousness or expressly reflects back upon itself. It comes to realize the contradiction, which it must deploy as a criterion of correctness is at the same time the organon of truth. That is, it comes to realize that every particular instance of knowledge becomes knowledge only through and by means of contradiction. And this is the way in which this negative principle, this principle of contradiction, is actually derived from the Kantian doctrine of antinomies, as Hegel presents it. You will rightly expect me at this point to provide some further clarification of these issues in terms of a specific model, as it were. I do not wish to disappoint this expectation, but I should also tell you that, in doing so, I would actually contravene Hegel's own practice in a serious way. For Hegel was always extraordinarily skeptical towards the concept of examples, 
There are a couple of passages in the encyclopedia where Hegel rather ostentatiously rejects the suggestion that he should provide examples. Why Hegel should act in this fashion, why he should refuse to furnish examples, and it is especially difficult for pre-dialectical consciousness to understand Hegel properly in this regard, is not so hard to grasp, for the concept of example always presupposes that we have a universal conceptual range or field at our disposal, something which is firm and reliable, positively given, a reified result, which can be exemplified in the particular case which it subsumes. But in Hegel, this very conception of a universal logical field within which the particular is grasped is suspended, at least here on the level of the speculative concept. That is to say, there is here no universal conceptual field which includes so many things within it. For the universal conceptual field consists precisely in the life of the particular it grasps within it. It fulfills itself through the particular. It does not merely cover or include the particular, but arises out of it. It has its life in the particular, and nothing particular can thus be regarded as a merely lifeless example, which has been abstracted from it. And this is, in fact, what makes it so extraordinarily difficult when one is required to think dialectically to provide an example of the dialectic. Nonetheless, while fully aware of these difficulties, I would like to try and offer you an example here, indeed a rather simple and elementary one, and you may think a rather shocking one. Let us take the proposition X is a human being. The first thing we might say about this proposition, insofar as it subsumes Mr. X under the logical species human being, is obviously that it is correct, assuming that we are talking about a human being as distinguished from, say, other biological species. But consider for a moment what this means. X is a human being. A human, we have said. If in general you say X is a human being, as in the case of the usual logical form A is B, there is a certain problem in this, for the A that is supposed to be B here is not the whole of B. Rather, B is a universal, and the A is only a specific representative of the former. There is indeed an identity here insofar as the particular phenomenon, the individual, A, is subsumed under concept B, but nonetheless the identification involved is not a complete one. Now Hegel would say that what is formally implied here, that X is indeed a human being, though in expressing this in the logical form A is B, you see that A is precisely not the whole of B, but only a representative of B actually has a very serious meaning, for he would say, and this I think also reveals something of the rigor of the remarkable freedom of the almost playful superiority which dialectical thought actually involves, that if I subsume the X under the concept of the human being, then the concept of human being includes everything possible which the individual X in fact is not. He would not simply content himself therefore with a primitive biological definition of human being, but would say instead, if we are talking about a truly vital comprehension of the human being as such, that we must think in terms of categories such as freedom, individuation, autonomy, the possession of reason, and a host of other things, all of which are already implicitly contained in the concept of human being as the objective character of the latter. And it is nothing but an act of arbitrariness to omit or ignore such categories in order to provide an operational definition of the human being, as something which actually possesses these or those generic characteristics of a biological kind. We need only to listen attentively to the expression human being. I believe to realize it involves more than just the differentia specifica that marks it off from the next nearest species, i.e. the anthropoid apes. And indeed Hegel would say if this emphatic dimension is always already involved on the on the concept of the human being. The moment that implies someone is rightly a human being, as I would put it, then the proposition X is a human being is also at the same time untrue. For the emphatic moment which is involved here, even though it may not already have clearly emerged as such, is certainly not yet realized here and now in any particular existing being. One could almost say that something like a human being does not yet exist at all as the emphatic concept of the human being objectively and intrinsically implies and understands this.
In other words, the proposition X is a human being is right or correct, as I said before, but is also false. And I believe that we need only to apply this proposition really seriously to any human being to indicate that the individual in question is a human being. And we will realize this difference at once. We'll realize that the individual does not yet really do justice to the concept of the human being in the emphatic sense, the concept of the human in terms of absolute truth. And this, of course, presupposes that we already possess such an emphatic concept of the human being, ultimately the concept of a right and genuine human being, ultimately, indeed, the concept of a right and genuine arrangement of the world in general. When we say human being, the expression says more to us than the mere generic concept or species, even if we are subjectively unaware of this. I believe that I have perhaps shown you something at least of the climate of this thinking, something of what is really meant by the concept of dialectical contradiction. We could say that dialectic, insofar as it is a doctrine of contradiction, critiques the simple logical coherence of the world. For contradiction or absence of contradiction, which are of course correlative concepts. Correlative concepts is precisely the logical criterion here. One can undertake to reduce the whole of logic to non-contradiction. And this has indeed been done. Now, if we ascribe such a central role to the concept of contradiction, as Hegelian philo philosophy does, this implies something that I have already explicated to you in a very different context. It implies that we cannot just acknowledge the logical coherence of the world, cannot acknowledge without more ado that the world and our thought are identical with one another, that the world and thought essentially exhaust one another. Rather, we acknowledge precisely that they diverge from one another. And here we must confront the paradox that this divergence between thought and the world is in turn necessarily mediated through thought. Thought itself must therefore strive to grasp precisely what is not thought. And this paradox, that it must try and do what it cannot do, reveals itself in, any, in every particular judgment that thought makes and refers that judgment to the whole the connected totality into which thought in its contradictory character must precisely unfold. We say in conclusion, therefore, that the Hegelian idea of contradiction follows from the emphatic concept of truth itself.